Well, some of you, as we are at this point in our service, may be feeling a little bit like my son, tired, needing to lay his head down in his mom's lap. I had to pick him up, put his feet on my feet, and uh, helped him out, helped him to start singing and, and being engaged. And so let's just go before the Lord, asking his help. Because of all the times to be drowsy and tired and, and dozing off, this is not the time when we hear God's word. So let's go before the Lord and ask God for help so that we could benefit from his word. We need him. We need it. Let's pray. Father, we are so desperate for you to meet us where we're at today, to speak to us from your word. Give us truth. Give us clear, biblical, life-changing truth. Oh God, would you put a guard over the door of my lips even that I might not sin against you and say something that's not in your word. I feel the weight of that, Lord. I want to represent you correctly. Oh God, help us all to be to be able to see from the Bible what it is that you've revealed and that our lives might be changed. We say these things in Christ's name. Amen. Victor Lustig was born in Austria, Hungary in 1890. And he was an imposter. He was a con man. He would end up getting pneumonia in the famous or infamous prison near Northern California, Alcatraz. And believe it or not, he would be, transform, uh, he would be transferred to a medical prison hospital and die in Springfield, Missouri, of all places, close to us. We're all familiar where that is. You see, Lustig tricked people for a living. And though his occupation, ironically listed on his death certificate, was an apprentice salesman, in reality, he was just a con artist to the core. And he was really great at it, actually. Let me give you a few examples of Victor Lustig's connery for instance, which is not a word just for you English nerds out there, not a word. Don't think Sean Connery, but think con man, con artist, or thievery. Here's the new word to see his connery. You know what I mean. Victor Lustig began his career in conning other people by selling counterfeit money-making machines. The machine was known as a Romanian box, or also nicknamed a money box. And he convinced people to purchase these machines. He would preload $100 bills into the machine, so when they tested it out and took the bills to the bank to affirm that it would pass as genuine, they would believe it actually worked, and they would buy these machines from him. He had enough $100 bills in there that he could skip town and get away without anybody ever realizing that they had been duped. And if you think that was good or bad or however you put it, like, that's only the beginning of his career. He would actually trick someone into buying, hear this, the Eiffel Tower of all things. And he also con the infamous Al Capone or Scarface as he was known and nicknamed as as well later when he would get to America. Now, I'm going to tell you quickly about those two stories because I can't just say that and then not tell you about it, uh, of course. In the mid-1920s, uh, Victor confidently approached wealthy business owners after he learned the important news to him that the Eiffel Tower that was built in 1889 for the World's Fair was originally only intended to last about 20 years. 
and the famous monument was showing wear and tear and needed lots of maintenance and was going to cost a lot of money. And it was costing money for people to fix it. So he pretended that he was a government official and he set up meetings with scrap metal dealers. And he claimed that the Eiffel Tower needed to be demolished and broken down for the materials. According to the website, history.com, one dealer thought he was clever and he bribed, or so he thought, right, Victor Lustig to sell him the Eiffel Tower for a large sum of money instead of demolishing it. This scrap metal dealer didn't find out until later that it was all a big scam. He was so embarrassed that he didn't even press charges and Victor Lustig got away with the cash. You can't make this stuff up. And then, as I mentioned, when he got to America, Victor planned his potentially deadliest scam with the mobster Al Capone, who, as we would know from someone like that, would certainly have killed Victor had he been caught and found out about his schemes. He talked Capone into investing $50,000 at the time into a promising business endeavor, only then, and a few months later, to return the money to Capone with a sob story about how it didn't work out, but he, could, he returned every penny back to Capone, and Al Capone, lo and behold, felt sorry for Lustig and gave him $5,000 to help him out through the hard times. Would you believe it? He even conned a mobster, and also, would you believe it, even gangsters, I guess, have a heart in certain situations. He trusted Lustig. He conned him. Clearly, Lustig was not what he appeared to be to those he conned, was he? In fact, Lustig is so well known that he would later uh, be attributed to him the irreverent Ten Commandments for con men. I'll share with you a few of those principles, not so that you could put them into practice, but just so you can know how conniving and, and uh, shady that this guy was. He says, never boast, but let your importance be quietly obvious. See how deceptive he was? He's just tricking people his whole life. Wait for the other person to reveal any political opinion, then agree with them. And then the last one here relating to our context, let the other person reveal their religious views then have the same ones as, as them. Lustig was a master deceiver. And he made a career out of it. Now up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been going after the hypocrite Pharisees over and over again. Using them as a test case of what not to be like in the kingdom. Now here, as we get to his conclusion of the sermon the next few weeks, Jesus turns here and drives home and addresses a different audience. He addresses not the religious hypocrites, the Jewish people who, who said that they were pursuing God in that way, but he actually goes to address a different kind of hypocrite. Someone who claimed to be a, a Christian or a believer. Someone who really, kind of like Lustig, is deceiving others around them. Fakes who are self-deceived. In fact, the audience here isn't even someone like Victor who, who knew what he was doing and was self-consciously pursuing to deceive others. The audience here, actually, that Jesus is addressing are self-deceived, warped mind, Christian hypocrites who were not even aware of it at the time that they were phony themselves or that they were faker in their profession of belief in Jesus. They were thinking that they were something that they weren't. And our entire 
sermon is going to deal with these unknowing fakers. This leads us now to our text and our first point. And number one, hard Christianity, easy fakes. Look with me in your Bibles at Matthew 7 and verses 13 through 14. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So here we see Jesus, the greatest preacher that there ever was, really transitioning from the body of his sermon to that conclusion to really turn from the main arguments of the sermon and land the plane by driving home action items for his listeners to actually hear and apply. One of the reasons we have weekly responses to the word of God here is to encourage not just simply people to be hearers of the word, but actually to put in practice what they are learning from the word. To believe differently. Or to live differently in accordance with what the Bible teaches. I hope you can see here Jesus in his conclusion is after appealing to his listeners for a response. He's exhorting them here to do something. He exhorts us here to do something. He's applying all that he has preached to his listeners. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Martin Lloyd-Jones, mentioned him before, my favorite preacher, emphasized that Jesus never simply gave a lecture. He never just listed facts without the purpose of producing change and action and transformation in his listeners. He said that Jesus was always preaching, seeking a response. And Jesus was preaching to believers in the kingdom about life in the kingdom, warning them about what was ahead, what was coming to them. And here he appears, appeals up front here to two different roads and two different gates that people travel on and go through. Robert Mounts says this about the two ways. He says, the choice is clear. Follow the crowd with its characteristic bent towards taking the path of least resistance, or join the few who accept the limiting demands of loyalty. The easy way now will turn out to be the hard way in the end as it ends in destruction. It ends in judgment and hell. Whereas the hard way that's hard now will lead to eternal joy or eternal life. So I hope we could see that these two roads and gates are leading to either heaven or hell. You've got the popular, easy road leading to hell, and lots are on it right now and going through it and have gone through it. Then you've got the road less traveled, the harder road, going through the narrow gate leading to heaven. MLJ puts it like this, and really many different preachers and commentators either give him credit by using the same illustration or use the illustration and not even quote him on it. He says this, going through the narrow gate through Jesus Christ himself is more like a turnstile. It's not like a large gate opening up for groups of people to flock through. He emphasized multiple times in his preaching that each man or woman must individually enter through the narrow gate of Jesus Christ alone. You ever been to a sporting event where you had to go through a turnstile? Only one is allowed through at a time because each individual is 
count it. You can try to put someone up and over or jump over it, and if no one's looking, you might get in, but there will be later no record of you entering the park because each individual is counted. Jesus is saying here, there is only one way to heaven, only one way of salvation, only one way into the park. John 14, 6 says the same thing. Jesus said to him, and you could see it on the screen, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? Except through me. Jesus is the turnstile. Only through him. Jesus is the exclusive, narrow way. His teaching is narrow. What he put forward is narrow. His gospel is narrow. And this narrow plan of salvation, you see, it's just not popular in our world today, is it? Think about it. You know, so many. Even those that we're going to see in the final two points, even some of those who profess faith in Jesus Christ are entering Not through the narrow gate and Jesus, but they're on the broad road now to hell. Our world doesn't like only one way. They like many options. They like many lifestyles. Many ways to live. They say, who are you to judge me? They say, Christianity is just way too narrow. Just way too exclusive and unloving and intolerant for them. Our world wants to preach not one way, but many ways to live. They want tolerance at all costs, and they will rewrite the ingrained morality to include all kinds of morally twisted and insane things to what? Widen the road. To broaden the gate. But Jesus, you see here, he doesn't budge even one inch. He is the only way and salvation is only found in him. As Acts 4.12 says, and you could see it, read it in your Bible, write it down in your notes, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved saved. Jesus is the only way. He is the narrow road, the narrow gate. No one will be saved who is not believing and following him. Which road are you on? Which gate have you entered through? The narrow way? The, the hard way, the, the less popular way, the way that's difficult, not your easy walk in the park kind of Christianity? Or have you decided, be honest with yourself, whether you're conscious of this or not, be honest about where you're at. Have you decided to follow the broad and easy road of the world? Say you're a Christian. The road that the masses are pursuing. The road that it doesn't matter what you believe, they say. As long as you're sincere, they say. It doesn't matter how you live or who you love, as long as you're happy. Hear this. If you are on this easy, broad road and you call yourself a Christian even, that means you're a fake, just like Victor Lustig was. So be honest with where you're at. For some, maybe even here, are self-deceived and even deceiving others, saying that you're on the narrow road, the Christ-centered road, all the while really actually being on the broad road all along, going through the broad gate with the masses. Some just like it easy like that. They, They want it their way. They prefer to be on the easy road while claiming to be saved all along so that they can keep their connections and they can keep 
the appearance is up. But someone who's like that, you see, they're nothing but a fake. If you're a fake, it is better for you to see it now and be honest about it and repent and turn to the narrow gate of Christ for salvation. That's true of my conversion testimony. I was on the broad road. I said that I loved Jesus. I walked aisles. I was baptized, all of these things. But I was on the broad road. I did not have saving faith in Jesus. I did not have life change. I wasn't a new man or young man or new anything. I was an old, sinful, wicked in my sins, loving my lusts, pursuing my ways. I was on the broad road, though I said I was on the narrow road. It's better for you to know and be honest with where you're at now before it is too late. It's better to know now than to continue on that road like a self-deceived imposter that's gonna lead you to your own Alcatraz experience eternally. But for those of you here who are genuine Christians, who are on the narrow road, going through the narrow gate, this morning through Christ alone, Jesus turns and helpfully warns you in this passage. He warns you away from the deceiving trickster type fakers that are around you that could so easily confuse you. It's so relevant for us all because some of us may have been duped by other fakers in the past. You may even be being duped right now by someone who says that they are a believer, says that they love Jesus and goes to church and was baptized, but yet they are no more saved. They're no more saved than even the most wicked and rebellious and obvious of heathens. They're just hiding it a little bit better. This is very relevant to open our eyes to the warnings that Jesus gives. This leads us to our second point and number two. Faker danger, withered fruit. Look with me in the Bible, in your Bibles, to Matthew 7 and verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus is so gracious and helpful here to show genuine Christians, believer, if you're here, to show you what you will or have already run into in your life. He knows that you, Christian, here with us this very day, will run into those who look like Christians, talk like Christians, and even sometimes sneakily act like Christians, kind of like I did as a young man. Oh, from the outside, you would think I was just a good Christian boy or young man following the Lord, but I wasn't. Acting like sheep in the fold of Christianity when you're not. In reality, some people who profess Christianity are no more Christians than Victor Lustig was a governmental official with the authority and right to sell the Eiffel Tower. Jesus says that even some who claim Christ who claim to be sheep like the rest of the believers, who claim to be a part of the church, are actually ravenous wolves who can and will bite your arm off like a grizzly bear if you aren't careful. They are so dangerous and you may not even see it coming. Many are friends with these fakers, with these imposters, 
with these hypocrites, with these false prophets. Now, just to be clear that we're thinking about this rightly, these false prophets are not coming to you or to me or to us with a sign on their head blinking, danger, danger, like a Bugs Bunny cartoon that you might see or have seen when you were younger. These false prophets don't seem scary at all. They may seem just like the rest of us in the flock. Don't you see that that's Jesus' exact point here? What does he say? He says that they look like sheep, that they sound like sheep, that they act like sheep. This is true for teachers. This is true for members of the church, preachers, pastors, people who say that they're Christians, act like it, but there are some who aren't. Picture this. Let's say we walked outside after service and went through the doors there. We walked outside and we saw a flock of sheep walking down the street. This is not as far-fetched as in many places because I remember one time a cow moseying around Gallatin and near our church. I got pictures. Someone sent me pictures of it. Let's just say sheep are going by. What would we think when we saw sheep? We would, we would think, there's sheep. That's kind of weird, but there's sheep. Why? Because they look like sheep. They act like sheep, and they're sheep. It's just, it would strike us odd, but we would see sheep coming near the church. But how do we know that those, quote, sheep are not just some big dog kind of dressed up like a sheep to trick us or something? How do we know that they're not just robots or something? They're kind of from a distance. Maybe someone's playing some kind of a trick. We don't know. We just see sheep and we just assume that's sheep. Same thing when someone walks into our church. They say, I'm a Christian. They talk a little bit like a Christian. They maybe even sound like, if they're teaching or something, a Christian. But just because someone says it, that doesn't actually mean it's always the case. Why? Because some people, some people are not, as we saw in our introduction, what they appear. The money box doesn't really produce the counterfeit, undetected money as, as it was claimed in that deceptive way. And those who bought that kind of thing kind of had it coming to them in their own deceptive, conniving ways, right? Their shady ways. But things are not always as they appear. Not everyone who claims to be Christ or to follow Christ should be trusted at their mere words always. In fact, some of these false professors, these fakers, are downright dangerous and can and will hurt you and us and your family and others if we're not careful. Literally, we're thinking about this this morning, even in our Sunday school, as Jeremy taught us in Revelation, many, 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 if not all, the letters in the New Testament are written to address, at least in part, false teachers, false prophets, warning about the Antichrists. We saw it in our First John series. We see it in the book of Galatians. Pastor Wood's preaching Jude, and the whole book is about warning against false teachers. We saw it in the book of Revelation. We see it all throughout the scriptures. Warnings against falsehood. God cares about this. The point here is for genuine Christians, for, for you and me, if you're a believer, to be on guard and to watch out for these fakers. But how do we know whether we run into a wolf in sheep's clothing or an actual Christian? Or how can we examine ourselves in these things? Because if this whole thing is about self-deception, shouldn't we double look and pause and think and examine our own hearts as well? I remember when I had a profession of faith, I didn't think twice of it until I was converted. I thought I was all good, smooth sailing. But I wasn't a believer. I was self-deceived. God opened my eyes. Praise God for his grace. Who knows? Maybe God may be opening someone else's eyes here this very day. So how do we know? Uh, Jesus here warns that it's not about simply what somebody says, is it? But about how 
they live and act and what they teach. What we need to look at is not simply if someone comes to our church and says that they believe and that they're a Christian, says that they love Jesus. That would be important. You'd expect that for Christians. But we also need to look at and hear what they're teaching and how they're living. The passage here says we need to examine their, what, fruit. If the fruit of their living is rotten to the core, if they're not salt and light in this world, if they're not like a city on a hill and shining in the dark ways, but they themselves are living in dark and sinful and unrepentant life styles and pursuits and thinking, and if they're just bearing bad fruit all over the place, withered and dried up and even unedible, not salt, not light, not good fruit, but just bad fruit, Jesus tells us here we are safe to ignore their false claims and that we must deny that false profession of deceived person, the false profession of faith. We need to see that they're imposters by their deeds and their teachings and their bad fruit. For example, if someone teaches, for instance, it just doesn't really matter how you live. As long as you are sincere, the morality is just in the eye of the beholder, and the Bible's context, it's just so old and dated, and just, it, it was for back then, it's not for now. And that Jesus, he just wants to love you and love us and love all of us regardless how we live or regardless of what we believe, doesn't really matter. I want you to hear and see whether they're preaching or not, whether you're just having a conversation with them, that you are speaking with and talking to a wolf. Those are signs of a wolf, not a sheep. They may seem like a sheep, but they are a wolf. You need to see it and warn others about that kind of thing to see that it's wrong, to see that that's bad fruit, bad teaching, to see that it's destructive, that that's the broad road kind of way. That's the broad gate leading to hell. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. See it. Expose it. Warn others by it. In fact, according to the letter of Titus, do you realize that this is actually Pastor Wood and myself's job description, one of our job descriptions? Because according to Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul writes to Titus, he says in verse 9, as it relates to pastors, he says this, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. I've recently had to engage and address, sadly, a former pastor who I know who actually even served as one of the pastors of the church that I served in California way, way back in the day before I became a pastor there. He had moved on and moved away. I knew him. He was promoting a heretical false teacher on Facebook. And he was living in unrepentant sin and no longer going to any specific church, basically claiming that he was enlightened in all these ways. I was compelled to warn other Christians who knew him, who I loved, people that were friends with him that I used to pastor, then to warn them to no longer listen to this wolf in sheep's clothing. Because you see, the fruit of his life, the bad fruit of his teaching, contradict, it contradicted his former teaching and his former profession of faith and even his current profession of faith. He was still saying he was a Christian. He needed to be exposed and avoided, not listened to, not given a platform to deceive. Paul goes on in his letter to Titus, warning and explaining about these things in false prophets. And look with me again now at Titus 1 and verses 10 to 11, or see it on the screen. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. You see, families are getting hurt by this false teaching. False prophets. Paul goes on to say in Titus 1 and verse 13, he says, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply 
that they may be sound in the faith. So Jesus points out here that the fakers and their way of living leads to destructive, unhealthy teaching and communication and hurts us, and we need to be beware of them. Paul also reminds us that these types of false teachers need to be rebuked. These fakers are dangerous, and they can hurt you. Jesus says, so we should recognize them by what they are, not by just what they claim, but by their fruit of their living and their teaching. Paul concludes this thought on false teachers to Titus in Titus 1 and verse 16, and I want you to see it again. Talking about the false teachers, he says, they profess to know God. Do you see that? These false teachers, false prophets, living and teaching in false ways, what do they do? They profess to know God. But what what do they do? They deny him. Who is him? God. They deny God by their what? Works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Let's listen to the warnings of Jesus and Paul and be wary and aware of dangerous fakers and their withered fruit. This leads us now to our final point and number three. Confident faker, deadly surprise. Have you ever heard this saying from your parents, maybe? Or, or maybe have you ever said this to your children? You are in for a rude awakening. If you have, you know what that means. You know it's a warning about the consequences of unwanted actions. You keep it up. Jesus says that some who say they are Christians, that say that they believe in Jesus as Lord even. Say, Lord, Lord, even. Will not enter the kingdom of heaven because they are and were not in it to begin with. Let's see it in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He says that some of these professing Christians are so self-deceived, so warped in mind, claiming to love Jesus, yet they are in for a rude awakening and final judgment. And the rude awakening that these fakers have coming to them is the terrible, sobering, deadly surprise that anyone could ever even face. It's like when we showed up to Disneyland as a family thinking we were going to be let in by an employee friend that I knew. We got all ready. The kids were so excited to go. We drove all the way to Anaheim from Marietta over two hours in traffic in the morning and Hours of preparing the night before and the day of to just get everything together for that big old long day. But when we finally got to the front gate, we found out that my employee friend was mistaken about their free guest passes and that it was a blockout day and that they could not let us in as we were all excitingly anticipating. And if you know anything about Disneyland prices... It's not just something that you're just like, okay, we'll just pay for those tickets because we didn't have the cash at the time to pay for those tickets. Some professing Christians, can you imagine it? Will not be let into heaven. Can you imagine it? When they expected to get in to heaven. 
They'll be standing there thinking, I deserve to get in because I did this or that, or I said this or that. But they're going to find out some that their religious works were nothing but phony con men, con games that they were playing. And they will experience the most horrific reality of receiving the judgment that they were not anticipating. In fact, they were anticipating the opposite. They were thinking rewards. They were thinking heaven, but they got the opposite. Now, some of you may be here frightened about this thought. Have you thought about it before as you've read this passage? And maybe you've wondered, how do I know whether I'm genuine or not? And think, what if I find out one day that I'm a faker? Well, the questions I have for you now, and and listen up to these questions for all of us. They're so important, life and death. Have you entered through the narrow gate of Jesus Christ and his gospel alone? And are you, as the text just said that we read, doing the will of the Father who is in heaven? And do you know Jesus? Not just do you know about Jesus, but have you entered through the narrow gate of Jesus Christ alone? The true Jesus. Do you believe the true gospel from his word? Do you know and pray and love the true God, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And what is this will of the Father in heaven that was mentioned here? John 4, 40 says, and I want you to see it in your scriptures and jot this down. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Do you look to Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? And then also do you live like Jesus and do what he commands? 1 John 2, 3 through 6 says this. I want you to see this as well. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is what? A liar. Or you can substitute a con man or woman. A deceived person is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But, verse 5, whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Talking about Jesus. If you have entered through the narrow gate of the only way and belief in the only Jesus Christ That means that you are a believer and that you've been saved by the grace of God alone. And that means you're doing the will of God by trusting in Jesus alone. But then, as we saw even in our first John series last year, that genuine believers, not fakers, genuine Christians, not imposters, genuine ones, we saw that believers who not only are the ones who just say that they believe, but who have genuinely been transformed and converted. Their lives have been changed. They're new men and women. These genuine Christians will also obey the Son and seek to be like Him. Not perfectly. Nobody can. But they want to be like Christ. They want to look to His Word and do what He says. They're by and large seeking Jesus, his word. That's what being a disciple is. So if you're doing the will of the Father and believing and entering through the narrow gate of Jesus, and if you know this Jesus, you have a relationship to him, you got a new relationship with God because of Jesus, then you have nothing to worry about. That means you are a believer. Praise God for the miracle of work in your life because if it wasn't for his work, you wouldn't be any of those things I just mentioned. But, and I say this 
with sober seriousness and care. If you are simply a faker, professing Christian, but not loving him or doing and seeking to do repentantly, of course, what he says, and you don't believe in the true exclusive gospel through Christ alone, the only way of salvation, then I say this to you, you have a rude awakening coming to you. And you will experience something far more disappointing in the future judgment than my family did that day when we were unable to get in to Disneyland. And I even point this out once again, even if you say, Lord, Lord, in Matthew 7, 22, see it on the screen or in your Bibles, on that day, listen to this, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Kind of like Judas did himself, for instance. Judas was a professor of Christ. Everyone thought he was a Christian doing these mighty miracle and works and doing all these things and being with Jesus. And what happened to Judas? He went to eternal judgment. Or as John MacArthur has pointed out, kind of like some of those supposed faith healer, prosperity preachers you might see on television. But not just that. This gets closer to home. And I think the teacher, Philip Jensen, pointed this out very helpfully and listened to his words. He says, Jesus gave warning to the disciples in light of the popularity of his ministry that could easily have been confused about the nature of the kingdom of heaven and about the nature of entry into the kingdom of heaven and about the nature of fishing for men. He said, some might say, if I am preaching like a prophet and doing miracles of the kingdom and then surely I am in the kingdom, right? No, he says, there are false prophets who also claim in the name of the Lord Jesus and do marvelous miracles, phony miracles even. He says the true sign of being in the kingdom of heaven is not the popularity or success of your ministry, but the obedience to the heavenly Father. Are you obedient to the heavenly Father? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Going through that narrow gate, the turnstile that just goes to Jesus alone. Seeking to do what the Son says. Seeking to be like Jesus. If that's you, that means you're genuine. And you are in the kingdom now and will receive kingdom rewards in and through Christ in the future. Praise God for that. But if not, and you're looking like Victor Lustus, and you are an imposter like him, and you are outside of the kingdom in reality, on the broad road to destruction, and will not receive eternal rewards, but will actually receive eternal judgment. Because Jesus clearly says here in this passage that the fakers, according to Matthew 7, 19, will be cut down and thrown into the fire, which is reminiscent of that terrible baptism of fire that John the Baptist warned about earlier in the book. See to it that you do not experience the fakers' surprise. See to it that you know Jesus Christ alone for salvation. See to it that you are genuine and not a faker. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your warning to us so that we might see the potential deception and confusion and danger all around us. Would you help us all to examine our hearts even and be encouraged in the gospel of your Son if we are, in fact, genuine. But then would you also open up the eyes and hearts of those who may not, in fact, love the gospel like they may say. They may not be living for your son, Jesus Christ, or like him at all. Would you open up and convict hearts? Would you warn them now? 
even as you did through your word, so that they might not continue on in their self-deceived ways, that they might not continue on to the broad road of destruction. Would you turn them from the error of their ways to the gospel? We pray for them, we plead for them. And help us, O oh Lord, to be so encouraged by the gospel of your Son, all of us here who are believers. And help us to be urgently preaching this gospel of Jesus alone in a world that's going in every other direction. Help us to be faithful in that. And we pray that people would be saved in our town, in our community, and in our families by this very exclusive and great news of your Son. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen.